Ooh, happy Halloween. We're gonna talk about making magic wands and it. <coughs> that really does a number on your voice. Just imagine I'm still doing this spooky voice. We're gonna talk about making magic wands because it's Halloween and witches and magic and. Let's get into it. A little bit of a disclaimer before we get into the weeds. I'm not a practitioner of magic. It has nothing to do with my viewpoint about modern practitioners of magic. I'm just not one. So when I create magic wands, what I'm creating is an artistic expression, not something that is meant to be used as part of a specific practice. If you want to use it for that practice, please, please, please go ahead. If you want to buy one and then use it for LARPing or for cosplay or part of a costume or anything else, even if you just want to buy it as a piece of sculpture that you can put up, go for it. But just so we're clear from the beginning, I'm not going to be talking about charging wands. I'm not going to be talking about including crystals in wands. I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm, I'm talking more about the act of creating them and the things that I have learned over the past few years to create something that's going to last to create something that's not going to crack the advantages of using a split piece of wood versus a branch, so on. Let's jump in. I started carving wands because my son wanted one. He was really into to Sesame Street at the time and Abby Cadabby, and he wanted uh, a little magic wand. I actually carved two. The first one uh, w was a wand. I thought I could do better. And so I took a little piece of uh, hard sugar maple that I had and I carved that into a wand with a little star on the top and I carved his name into it. He loved it. And I've sort of been making them ever since. Now, when you make a magic wand, there are a number of different things that you can start with. Store-bought lumber. This is just a piece of a two by four. Whatever species of conifer is the construction lumber around where you live, that's what it's gonna be. The advantage to starting with something like this is it's pretty easy to carve. It's soft wood. It's not gonna put up a big fight. Whether you're using shop tools or you're using knives, you're not gonna have too hard a time. Plus, it's more or less billet shaped. You can also start with a log. This is a piece of red maple. If I go out from the center of it so that it's more or less quarter sawn and I knock off this part and I knock off this part over here, I'm going to get a really strong billet out of this. You can see that there's some twisting, some turning in the middle there. If you get far enough below that, it probably won't matter. And as long as you're taking it into consideration, it's going to be fine. The disadvantage to something like this is that it's red maple. It's not that hard, but it is significantly harder than pine. And so it's going to take a little bit more effort, especially if it's dry. You can, of course, also use branches. This one is from a black willow tree. You could turn this into a wand pretty quick. This has been fully dried out, so that means that once I carve it, it's gonna stay pretty stable. Willow is also pretty soft. This is a piece of red maple again. You can see the pith right there. That dark spot with that light spot in the center, that's the pith. You can see it's off center and that's just because of how the branch was growing off of the tree. It needed to be off center in order to hold the weight of the branch. You can also see that this is checked. That's what those little splits are there. And you can see that they're emanating from the pith. The disadvantage of using a branch is that the pith is still gonna be in there. And if you have haven't let it dry out enough, you are going to find cracks. You can use that if you want to, but you really need to be aware of it. If you just start carving, especially on green wood, wood that still has a lot of water content, wood that hasn't dried out, you are going to find cracks and they are going to develop as you're carving it. And if you don't plan for them, they could destroy whatever thing that you're making. And if you don't know if it still has water content in it, if it feels cold, if it feels wet, there's still probably water content in there. So let's talk about some wands. This is a little snake head and it's got a hollow spiral carved as the handle. I carved this 
out of a branch from one of my red maple trees. I made sure to get the pith out because I knew I was gonna do something really intricate with it. I wasn't totally sure if it was gonna be a snake yet, but I knew I was gonna do something really, really intricate. And if I had started carving it with that pith in there, it was just gonna check and crack all the way up. And something that's this intricate took me a while to do. So I don't really wanna start over. So I wanna make sure that I'm starting with a piece of wood that I know isn't gonna check or split. Here's a really, really early one that I made and it cracked all the way from the handle to the tip. This is why you get the pith out. When I was very first working on what would become my figure wands, I actually did have one that started to crack all the way up the back, like across the hip, up the spine. It was just a mess. I kept thinking, I can save this, I can save this, I can cut into this, I can get past this. And very, very soon it became apparent I couldn't. It was just too far gone. It was going to be more work trying to make it work with those cracks than just letting it go and starting another one. This one is another one made from red maple, and it's the figure wand I've finished that has worked the best. Something that I have learned. It is really, really easy to get this wand part so thin that it is going to snap if you look at it wrong. This is a piece of black walnut. When I picked it up, I noticed that it had this enormous knot, and I wasn't sure what to do about it. I thought, eh, this probably isn't gonna make a good wand. I kept working with it and working with it until I figured out how to make this so that it was the palm swell so that as you put it into your hand, it worked whether you were holding it with this facing into your palm or this facing out, and it could wind up as a really nice little handle. I enjoy holding it this way so that this little swirl, spirally thing, is where my thumb can go. Now, what do you use to do this? I use a Sloyd knife, which is what I use when I carve spoons as well. I will also use a detail knife and a chip carving knife. I will also use as finishing tools sometimes card scrapers of various different sizes, different shapes, different thicknesses. But by no means do you need to use knives. You can use carving tools like this. This is a Miller Falls set of carving tools. I see these online all the time. They are not that expensive and they are really good little carving tools. You can also use gouges or V-tools. You can even just use bench chisels. You can also, of course, use saws to cut the piece down. You can use an ax to split it. I just did a whole video about axes and ax safety and using the ax to split the wood and how you can carve a piece of wood with an ax effectively and quickly. You can use spoke shaves, you can use draw knives, you can use all sorts of stuff. I mean, for that matter, you can use a bandsaw and Dremel tools. Whatever it is that you've got around that you can use, Go for it. I'll usually get a piece down to roughly the size that I want it to be, and then I'll go in and I'll sketch out. Like, I'm gonna put the wand part up here. It's gonna come down this far. I'm gonna do, like, I don't know, a head. I'm gonna do a body. I'm gonna do the feet. Whatever, I just sketch it out onto the piece of wood, really rough, and then I ax it down to that shape. I re-sketch it, and I start to go in with knives, and I start to get more detail, or I start to go in with carving tools. I start to get more detail that way. I take it just a little bit at a time, and I've got a magic wand. And they can be as simple, as utilitarian, as complex as you want them to be, and it's all fine. It's a wonderful way to start learning more about carving, to experiment to really start to like dig into stuff. There are very few rules to this, which is one of the things that I really, really love about it. There's nothing that says you have to do this part this way, you have to do this part this way. As a quick example here, let's go ahead and see what we can do with this. I'm not gonna take this and knock off these parts because it's gonna take forever. Instead, I'm just gonna grab a chisel. So I've just stuck this stick in my vise. I've got a big chisel. I'm just gonna put it right here and then I'm just gonna do the same thing on the ends. Now, I can just grab my knife. I'm just gonna take it and around over the end. When I'm doing this with this knife, I'm holding it so that these three fingers are on the handle. This one is behind the knife. That way, I get pressure right on the knife without getting any of my fingers in the way of the blade. And I keep my other hand below where I'm cutting where there's a little bit of grain tear out here, I'm just gonna run my knife along there and slice it so it looks a little bit cleaner. 
and it looks more intentional. Then I'm just gonna look at how far back that had to go and I'm gonna look around it and I'm gonna say, okay, if I make a slice here and then I make a slice here, and then I make a slice back here, Now at least it's got some sort of design that follows. Then I can just go to where this branch was. I'm holding my knife like this. I'm putting it where I want it to be. And then from my shoulder, I'm pushing down. Makes a nice clean cut and it is always going away from you. It's a really quick way to get the bark off using just a knife too. You can also put your knife there and then pull this back with your other hand. I am noticing that there's a chance to follow what I did down here. I had to get rid of this because that's where that branch was. I can clean it up a little bit. Then I can go around the sides and I can create that same sort of pattern of that bark reaching up it. Now, that's pretty rough. But you know what? It's a magic wand. Took me all of 15 minutes, maybe. Would have gone even faster if I used a spoke shave. I can go back, I can clean up little spots where the grain's raised up, smooth it out, I can refine the shape, whatever, but it's a magic wand. It was a stick and now it's a magic wand. You can do this, you can create something and it feels incredible when you create something. And if it's not absolutely beautiful and if it's not the exact image you had in your head when you started, so what? It's good because you made it. The worst thing that can happen is you make something that's not exactly the same as it was in your head. And so what? You keep making, you get better. So go make something. Happy Halloween, and I will see you next time.